service of the new church aerobics. Basically what it was, there was an act this year on America.com. And it was supposed to be a moderating act. And they took one of the judges on stage and blindfolded them. And took another one of the judges and kept them down by the judges panel. And she selected a number and on the playlist they selected the number and then she didn't know what was up. Sorry, he was applying for it. And had ear plug, his ears plugged. Basically they picked a number and they went like this on one hand forehead, touched it, went, and then the other guy down below touched the other judge's forehead. And what happened was they said, Do you hear anything? And he said, Yes, I hear something. Well, when it got to the end of the act, of course, they passed more, but the judge that was down below was in shock, and I couldn't find the video that said this, but this video would have had most of it, but what he said was, I only wrote what the voice told me. You know, we are living in a day and age where people don't realize how rampant and how open the enemy's working are, and it's not always as in witchcraft, going down the street or anything like that, but sometimes it's entertainment that things we just, we don't catch, and he goes by unaware, because people aren't aware of what they're looking for. Tonight we're going to talk a little bit about demonology, demons and different things along that nature. Before we get started, I want it to kind of be an open discussion to some degree, does anybody have any questions concerning demons, possession, or anything like that? I want to open up the floor before we go anywhere else. What's that? I don't like it. You don't like it? But unfortunately, the sad part is it's part of the reality that we're dealing with every single day as Christians. God's out there, but so is the other guy out there working. And he's working rampantly because he knows that his time is short. I'm reminded of the maybe about two years ago, we were out visiting my brother-in-law. My sister-in-law was watching, I think it was also American's Got Talent. The other one that was Brings Got Talent, not that it makes any difference, but hers was America's Got Talent. And what happened was they got one of the judges involved, and once again, the guy who was on stage was doing a magic act to some degree start telling her things about happening in high school with a certain girl, brought certain things out, and they were all dumbfounded on how did this man know all these things about me that she never really shared with the judges panel or anything. That was high school song so long ago. Well, there are such a thing as familiar spirits. So tonight, to some degree, we're going to be looking at familiar spirits. What are familiar spirits? When we look at the Old Testament, the phrase familiar spirit occurs in seven verses in the Old Testament, and the plural form of it appears in nine verses of the Old Testament. I don't know if you want to get the if you did. You already did. Okay. And when we look at that phrase, familiar spirits, if we go especially to 1 Samuel chapter 28, and we'll be there to some degree if you want to jump in there, but 1 Samuel 28. Sometimes when you study it out, the Greek words and the Hebrew words, you'll have a word for familiar, you have a word for spirits, you know, or different things. But when we look in the Old Testament in this passage and compare it with the Hebrew words or the Hebrew translations, familiar spirits is all one phrase. And it's all summed up in the Greek and the Hebrew word O, O W B. When we look and it means this. From the same as apparently through the idea of prattling a, father, a father's name, properly a mumbling, a water skin, hence a necromancer, ventrilo ventriloquist, as from a jar. When we look at the Hebrew word O, O-W-B, it occurs in 16 verses of the Old Testament itself. I don't have all the passages down because it would take me a while to down 16 verses. But, there is a passage in the book of Job, when you look at that Hebrew word O-W-B, uh, it's actually translated, 
I believe it's vessel or bottle, something to that degree. So when we look at familiar spirits, what is probably the first thing that comes to mind for our thoughts with a familiar spirit? Not, not maybe with the Holy Spirit because he's familiar with us. But when we're talking familiar spirits in this sense, familiar spirit isn't like the Holy Ghost, uh, isn't the Holy Ghost, but a familiar spirit is a demon. So when we're looking at the devil's kingdom, a familiar spirit is a demon. And the people that are associated with familiar spirits, we would find in Acts chapter 16. Do you all remember how Paul and Silas ended up in prison where they sang praises to God at midnight? Do you remember what occurred to get them there? I'll tell you in a nutshell. Acts chapter 16. We have Paul and Silas. And they're going to pray at the river. In the New Testament, in the early churches, if they didn't have a church building, they that, you're exactly right, brother. You're exactly right. And they were all upset because they lost their money. So they got taken to the magistrates and then they got tossed in jail. But if we go back and focus on that young damsel a moment, why did her masters lose money? What was so special about the familiar spirit? Because in her day and age, the Greeks would refer to her as an oracle. The Hebrews would refer to her as a soothsayer. We would refer to her as a fortune teller, because that's exactly what it was. She was a fortune teller. And fortune tellers, wizards, those type of people, they use familiar spirits. What are familiar spirits? They are exactly what they sound like. They are spirits that follow you and I and they are familiar with us. They know our past. They know our present. They know what we've gone through. They know, they know how other people have treated us. If you go back to the early, what was it, 1900s, late 1800s, mid 1800s, they were called mediums. People, it was a popular thing. People would go to spiritualists. They would go see mediums. And they would call on their dead father, so forth, kind of like fortune tellers do. Where are they getting this information from? If Pappy, Grandpappy died and you were familiar with Grandpappy and all of a sudden it seems like Grandpappy came to the table, did Grandpappy really come to the table? No. The Bible says to be absent from this body is to be present from the Lord, uh, present with the Lord. Uh, once we pass on, we are facing the judgment. There is no such thing as ghosts in the sense that we know of it. When you're dead, you pass on. There is no lingering behind, but rather we have moved on to our eternal reward, or at least our eternal judgment. So how did Grandpa come back to the table? One of those familiar spirits that traveled with him his entire life, that knew his nickname for you, that knew maybe something special between you and him that no one else did. That's all a result of those familiar spirits. When we look at that word familiar, even getting going along with the Hebrew word, we find that the soothsayer, the oracle, the fortune teller, the medium, they are that vessel or bottle that the familiar spirit uses to bring forth the information. Now, how does God feel about familiar spirits? We find that God commanded his people that they should stay far away from familiar spirits or those that entertain them. Does someone want to find Leviticus chapter 1931? Leviticus 1931. And then I'll probably use you for the next three verses as well because they're just one chapter over. Leviticus 1931. You have a sister, Tina? 1931. 
So we have a command straight from God not to be bothered with familiar spirits, wizards, or those that deal with them. What about chapter 20 and verse 6? God says whoever goes after familiar spirits or wizards is not just bad enough, but he's got to cut them off. They have nothing to do with them. You know, if you go after a familiar spirit or you go after a fortune teller, I don't want, you're not mine. And then finally, verse 27 of chapter 20 there, Sister Tina. And you shall know that I am the Lord, which I So God doesn't just tell his people to stay away from them, but he says get rid of them. In the Old Testament, he said stone them, get rid of them, kill them. Don't just stay away from them, but get rid of them because they have nothing, no part of me. In Deuteronomy chapter 11, uh, sorry, chapter 18, verses 10 and 11, there shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his sons or his daughters to pass through the fire, or that uses divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consoler with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. In verse 12, for all they that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out before from before you. So God doesn't just say, stay away from them, which he does. He doesn't just say, get rid of them, annihilate them, stone them, kill them, because they are no part of my people. But he says, he can tell us why in Deuteronomy, he says, that it's an abomination. It's something that abhors me, is a, is a stench in the nostril of God. He wants nothing to do with it. And if God has nothing to do with it, his people should have nothing to do with it. When we look at those with familiar spirits, Isaiah chapter 29, verse 4, tells us their ranking. Would someone please find Isaiah 29, Verse 4. And thou shalt be brought down, and shall speak out of the ground, and thy speech shall be blown out of the dust, and thy voice shall be as one that hath a familiar spirit out of the ground, and thy speech shall whisper out of the dust. So God tells them that thou shalt be aware when it comes to proportion on the ground. And what does he say about his speech? His speech shall be as dust. And then he does a comparison. And what's the comparison? As he that has familiar spirits. Can you read that phrase just so I get it properly, please? Just the whole verse or what phrase? Um, the one dealing with the familiar spirit. Because it talks about low, okay. voice low as a familiar spirit, if I'm not mistaken. Voice shall be as one that would be. Yeah. Voice shall be as, as one of that hath a familiar spirit out of the ground. So it should be low. And what's our idea or the connotation that comes along with? And it could be true, but the person that's demon possessed, the voice changes. It gets deeper, it gets low. So the Bible is clear that stay away from people that have familiar spirits. God's people has no place with them. And it's actually an abomination. And the Bible says that it's a low, low place. When we look at the Word of God, there are people that had dealings with familiar spirits. In 2 Kings chapter 21 and verse 6, and I'll read that, if someone would find 1 Chronicles, though, 1 Chronicles 10, 13, and just hold that a second. 2 Kings 21 and verse 6. Second Kings 21 and verse 6. And this is speaking of King Manasseh. And he made his sons pass through the fire and observe the times and use enchantments and dealt with familiar spirits and wizards. And if you regard those verses that we just read a little bit ago, God said, don't have any part of them because they're an abomination. And he listed all these things. And speaking of Manasseh, the verse re finishes with, he wrought much wickedness in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. 
So Manasseh did evil in the sight of God because he dealt with all these things that God said don't do in the first place. And he was extremely wicked. Now, what does 1 Chronicles chapter 10 and verse 13 state? And we're going to talk about this account here in a moment. 1 Chronicles 10, 13. Why did Saul die? For, seeking that. Seeking it. And seeking the witch. And notice that the phrase there, seeking the witch, that, how did the phrase it, Mom? I'm trying to give me one. I know it, I know what it is, brother. I, I'm going to come out with something here in a second, so I want the exact Bible. What did you say? What did it say concerning the council? And one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it. Now, in 1 Samuel 28, verses 3 through 20, why don't we turn there because we're going to be talking about this a little bit. Neighbor, neighbor, even the David, 
because thou obeyest not the voice of the Lord, nor executest his fierce wrath upon Amalek. 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 Therefore hath the Lord done this thing unto thee this day. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with thee into it the hand of the Philistine. And tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with thee. And the Lord also shall deliver the host of Israel into thy hand of the Philistines. Then Saul fell straightway all along the earth and was sore afraid because of the words of Samuel. And there was no strength in him, for he had eaten no bread all day nor by night. Now, I wanted to bring out this passage because there is controversy concerning this passage. Some question whether or not this was a familiar spirit, or was this really Samuel that came forth? When we look at the whole passage, this is the account that Mom read in First Chronicles that was mentioned on why Saul was killed, why he died. This is part of it. It was because of his transgressions, but it was also because he sought to seek counsel from this witch that had a familiar spirit. Notice that the next day he's going to die. Him and his sons. Yes, sir. But did Saul really see a familiar spirit? Or did he really see Samuel in this passage? That is something I wanted to bring out as we're talking about this. To me, it appears that he actually, God actually allowed him to see Samuel. The witch said that she saw dogs coming in and out of the earth. Were those demons or were those actually angels? But the big thing that throws it out to me, and you can question that he came out of the earth. Well, in that time, people didn't ascend into heaven, but they went into the earth. Not to hell, they went into paradise. So is it far-fetched? No, it's not far fresh I would say. But the thing that catches me is the fact that when the witch saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. If it would have been a familiar spirit, she was familiar with spirits, those familiar spirits all the time. She talked to them all the time. Why would she cry out if it was another familiar spirit? But that is just some thought. But I do want to I did feel a letter God to talk about familiar spirits tonight. But we also need to keep in mind that as much as we rejoice over the fact that we're saved, that there is a battle going on out there. And as much as we may not like to talk about it, we need to be aware of our enemy. We need to know his tactics. We need to know what's out there. It doesn't mean that we know every single demon out there by name. That is what the Holy Ghost is for. He is the discerner. He's the one that helps us and guides us. He is the revealer of truth. But we also need to be aware that we be not taken off guard. That if somebody comes in and, we st and all of a sudden they start to tell them things of people's past, that, hey, don't, you need to watch out because there's, they're talking to the enemy there. You know, there's something not right there. If they don't know you, they never met you before, unless it's a prophet of God, and if their lifestyle doesn't show it, then they're getting their information from a whole other source. Let me ask you this. What happens to a demon when it's cast out of an individual? It finds somewhere else to go. Do we have a scripture verse that tells us what's happening during that time? I, don't, I, I want to start pulling too. Just trying to refresh memory. What happens when a demon is cast out? What's the verse that goes along with it? Well, it's uh, that one that put a demon put into uh, he went in this fine. So, so we know one thing about demons. They want to have their body. As soon as he was cast out of the demons, he went in the fine. Why did he go into the fine? Because he didn't want to go back to the other place. When a demon is cast out, they're going to go back to a familiar place. They're going to go back to where they received the most amount of worship. And at whatever point in time in the history that was, they're going to go back. But, while we're going through that process, do we have a scripture verse that tells us what's going on? Do you have it? Yes, I thought maybe you were looking at it here. KJV verse, uh, yeah, we'll go through dry notes. I 
phones are still listening. It's not being helpful. Now we'll go to the drive. Technology is not helping out right now. How about Matthew 12, 43? Thank you. 
design, he does do that. He does depression, he does do that. But he also does other things, like, oh, uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, those, some, some folks uh, maybe, uh, you know, take over the or whatever it is, whatever your weak spot is, that's what the devil's going to attack. Oh, absolutely. So it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, either uh, your mind, or it can be maybe uh, if he knows that if you're uh, concerned about your financial, that can be, I mean, he can, it can be any, oppression can come from any place. Absolutely. It doesn't need to just be something you can't see or touch. It can be physical. It yep. can be physical things as well. Um, I don't think, um, you know, he doesn't play fair. No, he doesn't. Whatever, no. whatever is, is your Achilles heel, so to speak, and that's what he's going to stop that. Huh? Right on. Yep, right on. I think blood. There's certain things that I uh, that I've just passed that are spots for me, uh, my children, my grand, my grandson. Yep. Those are places, and he does sometimes put fear in me for them. And all I do is just bleed the blood and continue. It, it's just living the life of faith. We have to trust. And trust isn't always an easy thing, yep. but we always have to go back to, um, you know what? Yes, um, God saved me right here. When He saved me. Promise me. I have these things, and the word says I'm praying about something, and, and you're praying, not praying for what you want, but praying according to what the word of God says. When I pray for salvation, my children or grandchildren, things like that. That's part, that's God's word. And, and if you're praying, and God will be faithful. His word says he cannot, you know, he will be faithful. And um, all we can do is plead the blood of Jesus Christ that if it's your mind, plead the blood over it every day. If, it's, if I'm concerned, like, I can keep blood over them every day. Every day. Not a day goes by that I go, now stand on that. Those are promises from God. That's what, that's what Jesus did in, in the wilderness with the devil. He used the word of God. That's what he used as a battle tool against the devil when he was being tempted. And that's exactly what we have to do. Because this is the only thing that's done. That's our sword. Yep. That's what we're fighting. I know there's times it seems like the stronger we try to become in Christ, the more stuff happens. If the devil's working against you and trying to take you down, then you're doing something right. If he's not doing anything, not coming against you, then I would be worried because that means that there's nothing happening. And I'm glad you brought that out because it's not just a battle in our mind help, but he'll use whatever weakness, including family members, whoever's close to you. And it may not always be having them work against you, but I know uh, one person of a preacher that the devil must not have felt like he could get a stronghold with him, so he started giving health problems to his wife. It may not be sin or that they're coming against you, but it's just other things that tie you up is what better concern, uh, type concerns your emotions, just to get you tied up, basically, is what it comes down to. Stopping you from praying. Yep. Mm -hmm. However, he can. And he's been around longer than we have. He knows the word of God better than we do. He's been around for a very, very long time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anything else before we close? Like I said, that's just what I felt led to teach on tonight in pre question. Was there a... Oh. Your wife. Well, I didn't... Is it? 
So we need to begin to bind those things. Um, Scott's getting ready to move, but we we can't we can't just stand back and let let these things happen. We have the power in the name of Jesus to do battle, and it's not easy. We don't want to fight and have to do battle, um, but this is what we have to do. We have to wrestle, and not not against flesh and blood. It's not against people in our lives, but it is. It is against the enemy. And we have to remember we have that power. Is that what I'm what I find very interesting about Ephesians 6 with the armor of God? It says, uh, it, it says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. When we rest on it, goes, it goes through all of that. And then it says, um, wherefore we take unto you the armor of God. So we stand the evil day, having done all to stand, stand, therefore. So, you know, it's telling us we have to do all of this. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. It's not going to be battles where we're hitting, and, and, but we need to stand. And and, uh, and in my mind, I think um, that we need to stand with the word of God. We have to have done all stand, therefore just stand. We have to be able to stand. She's right. We don't, we shouldn't have that spirit of should be able to plead the blood and, and, and take authority over that because we have that power through Jesus Christ. I think sometimes we, we get timid when we're both, because again, it is. Sometimes I think, Lord, I, I'd love to see the spiritual battle like with eyes. Do you know what I mean? To see what it would look like. But then the other part of me said, No, you probably don't want to see that. It's probably a very scary thing. We have no clue what's going on in the spiritual but we do have the power. And um, I've had is working with someone who had fear. Um, and just, and this was one of the verses that I uh, kind of shared. Um, and uh, again, it is the spiritual warfare that we're, that we're facing is very real. And, and people are, are um, you know, trying to live right and trying to be examples and trying to reach out. But the more we do that, the more we're going to get hit. Anyone else? If not, let us just stand. There is an offering plate in the back. If you want to throw something in there, and we're only done. 